I, uh, I want to welcome you to this event. This is hopefully what the first in a series of events we're going to be doing on the Islamic State. And it's brought to you and kind of inspired by the, guy, by the man that's speaking here today. He uh, contacted me. This is uh, Jean-Baptiste Maillard, forgive my <laughs> for French. Um, and he is a visiting PhD student from the University of Geneva. So this is a great opportunity that the International Law Society has to help uh, kind of bridge the gap between JD students and LLM students and visiting scholars that we, we have the uh, immense uh, opportunity to have here at Duke. So uh, without further ado, we're going to start, I think, with just a brief kind of lecture series. And then he is more than open to questions and debate. Let's just you know, keep it very civil and intellectual like Duke does well. So thank you very much, uh, Jean-Baptiste. Thank you very much. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today. Thank you very much for being here. Before I start, I just would like to thank Amy, um, of course, uh, and the International Law Society for organizing this event. Thank you also to um, Cindy and Taylor. Thank you for deleting these uh, wonderful messages that were posted on the Facebook pages. I don't know, for those who saw them, it's quite disturbing. But anyway, thank you for deleting them. And also thanks to the Duke Law School for welcoming me here as a visiting researcher. So you know, when you give a presentation, it's always good to start with something catchy, you know, like something sexy, as my supervisor back in Geneva will tell me often. Start with something catchy um, in order to get the attention of the audience, and in particular when you're a PhD student and no one knows, and who speaks French with a very heavy French, uh, who speaks English with a very heavy French accent, so I look for something catchy. And in this regard, actually, a video is always good. So I look for a video of the Islamic State. But the problem is that I could not find anything that would not immediately suppress your appetite. And this is how violent and shocking their videos are. So since we have to finish all this, uh, what is it called, chick fil -A or whatever it's called. <laughs> and it's Monday. It's a beautiful day, the first one in a while and that you had a nice Saturday night at a gala, so we're gonna try something else. So I look for something else, and at the end I ended up choosing three things, one map and two pictures. And the combination of these three highlights one of the most original and actually terrifying characteristics of the Islamic State. That is a group with a local objective, which is the establishment of a state, but which also has a huge global influence. And in that sense, I think Islamic State differs from any other terrorist group. So, one map and two pictures. In the middle, you have a map of Syria. So this is the situation in Syria as of January 18, 2016. In gray, this is how much territory the Islamic State controls. So all the big black dots, it's the cities and towns that the Islamic State effectively controls. And then the darker gray, this is the territory it actually, it's like the countryside territory it actually also effectively control. And the lighter gray, it's the territory that it does not effectively control, but where there is quite some influence of the Islamic State there. So you see how much territory they control. It's some sort of the, well, not the 50 shades of gray, but maybe the two shades of gray of the Islamic State, even though I'm not sure that, that the Islamic State will appreciate this comparison. On the right side, you have a guy called, for the French, I'm sure you know this guy, Ahmed Koulibaly, who was a French national who on January 8, 2015, attacked a kosher supermarket in Paris and killed four people on behalf of the Islamic State. That's on the right side. And on the left side, you have a guy called Jake Bilardi. Jake, um, as you can see, was a big fan of Chelsea. He was an Australian citizen, 18 years old boy recruited by IS online on Facebook, who blew himself up in a market in Ramadi, Iraq, on March 15, 2015. Well, he only killed himself, but IS used his death to prove its ability to recruit foreign fighters and all types of foreign fighters worldwide. So these two pictures and one map actually highlights uh, one of the main features of the Islamic State. So this dual dimension, local and international. So the existence of the Islamic State raises a number of questions, a number of issues in international law. Questions of use at Bellum, question of use in Bello, questions of human rights, criminal law, refugee law, public international law, all sorts of questions. 
And this is why the International Law Society and myself, we had this idea of organizing this series of legal seminaries about the Islamic State and international law. So throughout the semester, we will have a bunch of um, um, seminars, hopefully maybe, I don't know, we'll see, three or four maybe, in which various legal issues, international legal issues will be addressed. But before doing so, before dealing with specific issues of international law related to the Islamic State, we thought that it would be appropriate to have an introductory seminar, mostly non-legal, to introduce the Islamic State, to get to know the Islamic State, to understand it properly in order for us afterwards to understand properly the legal issues. So the objective of this seminar is really to give you an overview of, first of all, the historical origins of the Islamic State, second of all, the nature and characteristics of the Islamic State, and here, instead of listing the different features, I will conduct some sort of comparative study between the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda. Third, for those who are desperate to hear about legal stuff while eating their chicken fillet, I will also address the question of statehood. Because despite its name, Islamic State, is the Islamic State actually a state under international law or not? And then I will end my presentation with some thoughts on uh, how to effectively counter the Islamic State. Here, there are just some thoughts, my thoughts, that you may agree with or you may not, and it's absolutely fine, and we can actually discuss them afterwards during the discussion. I really look forward to the discussion afterwards. Uh, but again, these are some thoughts. Uh, I don't pretend to have the solution to end the conflicts in, uh, in, 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 um, in Iraq and Syria with the Islamic State, otherwise I would probably not be here. But yeah, these are just some thoughts. So let's start with the history, the historical origins of the Islamic State. How did the Islamic State come to life? Um, where does it come from? So regarding the history of the Islamic State, there are two very interesting things. The first one is that actually the Islamic State as a group of its own is actually much older than what we think. I mean, the first time I heard of the Islamic State was back in 2013, maybe 2012, but definitely not before. And actually the Islamic State as a state is actually much, much older. It was actually created in 2006. And then the second thing which is interesting is the fact that before becoming a group of its own, Islamic State was part of Al-Qaeda. And if you look today at the interaction between Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State, they are enemies. They are enemies. They are fighting against each other over the leadership of the global jihad worldwide. But before that, there was a time, the good old time of jihadist unity, where they were two, they were, the two of them were just one group. So that's something to keep in mind for the, for the rest. So there are five dates to, well, there will be more, but I just decided to choose five dates to understand the historical origins of the Islamic State. First one, 2003. 2003, what happened there? A few months after the overthrow of Saddam Hussein in 2003, al-Zarqawi, who was a Jordanian national, well-known terrorist, established uh, in Iraq the foreigner to two days um, Islamic State, a group called al-Tawid wal-Jihad. And this group was an armed group that aimed primarily at countering the US occupation. This group was a very, very, very violent group, which perpetuated very high profile uh, terrorist operations, such as the 2003 attack on the UN compound in Baghdad, and also uh, the beheading of Lawrence Foley and Nicholas Berg that I'm sure you heard about. So that was that group. And that's the beginning of the Islamic State story. Then 2004, Al-Tawid wal-Jihad becomes Al-Qaeda in Iraq. It becomes the franchise of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, the Iraqi branch of Al-Qaeda. And here there is a very interesting fact, because very quickly, Ben Laden, who was at the time the leader, she chief of the main branch of Al-Qaeda, dissociated itself from the Islamic State. And you know the reason? The reason is that they thought that the Iraqi branch was too violent. And here we are back in 2004, three years after 9-11, but they thought that the Islamic State was actually too violent for them. And they would be too publicly violent and more repressive of the civilian population, so they say, well, no, we are dissociating ourselves from our Iraqi branch, Al-Qaeda in Iraq. 2006, Al-Qaeda Al in Iraq, together um, with other Islamist groups, they all together give birth to the first Islamic State, the IZ, Islamic State in Iraq. And, um, and this is a, a very interesting year because IS as a group of its own was born in 2006. 
And then from then on, ISIS is going to grow very rapidly in Iraq and attracts more and more sympathizers. And actually, in particular, among two groups, first, the former members of Saddam Hussein's army, and second, among the Sunni minority in Iraq. So why the support of these two categories, which has been so crucial in the Islamic State's rise, it has been so crucial and it still does today, why did they decide to support the Islamic State? What happened to them? So if you turn to the fir first to the former members of the Iraqi's regime, of Saddam Hussein's regime, at first glance, it seems quite odd if you know a little bit the story of, of, of Iraq, because Saddam Hussein had very little in common with the jihadist movement. He had very little in common. Saddam was a great promoter of, uh, of, um, of Arab nationalism and secularism. So, but what happened is that after he was overthrown, all the members of his regime, the Ba'ath regime, were banned by the new Shia government from the political process. So they decided to turn, not all of them, but many of them, decided to, to join ISIS as a revenge against the new government. And then they got radicalized. But first, the first reason why is to take revenge against the new government. It's not because they were jihadists by nature. Then they became like that. You know, they all had mustache, that they all like um, shaved, and then they decided to grow beard. But it's, 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 first, they were, they, were, they, were, they were not jihadists by nature. So that's the first motivation they had. And of course, they brought to IZ their military expertise and of course, their knowledge uh, of the um, um, Iraqi political system. The second group is the Sunni minority in Iraq, which is about 30% of the population that IZ quickly brought to its side because of the new government, which was a Shia government led by al-Maliki at the time, um, which, uh, this new government sectarian campaign favoring the country's larger Shia population. And so, of course, they completely, and I think that was a big mistake what happened then, because in 2003, they completely alienated and even persecuted to a certain extent the Sunni minority in Iraq, which of course turned to the Islamic State. And I think when I will give some of my thoughts uh, about this, I think we have to focus on this, because this was, I think, at the time, a huge, huge mistake. And if today we get to get this Sunni minority back into the political process, then I think it's a good way to weaken the Islamic State. 2012 now, IZ become, becomes ISIS or ISIL, so Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, or Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant. This means exactly the same thing. It's just because they took advantage of the, um, of, um, of the instability of the country after, in the aftermath of the Arab Spring in Syria, and they decided to expand their activities. So as from 2012, they operate both in Iraq and in Syria. And in 2014, and it will be, will be done here with the historical origins, it's ISIS, ISIL becomes the caliphate. So they decided, they proclaimed themselves as the caliphate, and they decided they decide to rename themselves simply Islamic State. So actually, the correct terminology to use today, it's not ISIS, it's not ISIL, it's not IZ, it's just IS. Now, the nature and characteristics um, of the Islamic State, by comparison to those of Al-Qaeda, the Islamic State has many characteristics which I find particularly interesting when it comes to the founding structure, organization of the group. However, rather than listing these different features, I thought and I prefer to just put them into perspective with those of Al-Qaeda and try to understand the differences between the two groups. And we're, as we are going to see, there are many commonalities between the two groups, but also many, many differences, and actually many more differences than we can think at first glance. There are four characteristics on which I would like to focus. The purpose, what objectives are they pursuing, the members, who are the people who fight for them, the enemies, who are they fighting against, and the founding. Where does the money come from? These are the four main differences between the, two, between the two groups. Let's start with the purpose. Al Qaeda's struggle is globally oriented. Al Qaeda's objective is the global jihad and the implementation of the Sharia worldwide. That's the primary objective of Al Qaeda. Now, if you look at the Islamic State's primary objective, this is not the global jihad. Primary is objective, the primary objective of, his, of IS is the creation, the establishment of a state in Iraq and Syria. That's the primary objective they have. And this is why, actually, until very recently, all IS operations were all conducted locally in Syria and Iraq. 
And I remember actually attending a meeting two years ago uh, in Geneva where you had an expert in terrorism who was, which, who, who was saying that IS will never perpetrate any terrorist acts abroad. Why? First reason is because they're not interested. They just want a state. And second of all, because they don't have the expertise. They don't have the knowledge. Because if you look, for instance, at an operation like 9-11, it requires a huge amount of preparation, money, expertise. And that, at the time, he thought, and that was probably true, he thought that at the time there was, they didn't have the expertise. Well, things have changed since then. And also, these two different primary objectives, which remain today, you can also see them in the way the two organizations are organized. Because on one side, you have Al-Qaeda, who is a transnational network of cells, sleeper cells, and active cells. Remember the Hamburg cell, where 9-11 was prepared? That was a cell. But it's more like a transnational network. If you look now at the Islamic states, it's organized not as a network, but it has a very strong regional center of gravity in Syria and Iraq. So it's two different organizations. And as I told you, things have changed. Now the Islamic State has a second objective. The second objective is much more like Al-Qaeda. It's the establishment, the, like, like the global jihad. IS has progressively moved its operations to the global chessboard, and it, that sense got much closer to Al-Qaeda than it was at the beginning. And it's a very interesting evolution, this internationalization of all IS operations. Internationalization that took place in three steps. It's like a three-step three, three step process. First of all, foreign affiliation from foreign jihadist group, where IS, I think it started about two years ago, 18 months ago maybe, um, where IS started receiving formal affiliation from foreign jihadist group all over the world. And as to, I mean, um, up to date, more than 30 armed groups have formally pledged allegiance to the Islamic State. And they all commit the terrorist act on behalf of the Islamic State. The last example I can think of is what happened in Ouagadougou, the capital, the capital of um, Burkina Faso. Uh, I think it was 10 days ago or 15 days ago. Right. This operation was conducted by ACME, which is the, the, the Al-Qaeda branch uh, in Northern Africa. ACME pledged allegiance to the Islamic State. Therefore, the act has been committed on behalf of the Islamic State. Second step, lone wolf in the world. Sorry. Well, <laughs> And lone wolf in Western states. More and more individual, again, that started 15, maybe 14 months ago, when more and more individuals started committing terrorist attacks in Western countries on behalf of the Islamic State. So it's what we call the lone wolf, you know? These are individuals who do not receive any direct support from the Islamic State, material or financial, but who commit attacks on behalf of the Islamic State. Many examples. Uh, of course, the guy I showed you at the beginning, Ahmed Koulibaly, he acted on behalf of the Islamic State uh, in Paris on January 8, 2015. I'm thinking also of the attack on the Canadian Parliament in, in Ottawa, uh, I think it was in end of 2014. Um, and we also have the San Bernardino attack. San Bernardino attack, the couple acted and just a few hours before committing the shooting, they pledged allegiance to the Islamic State. So that's the second step in this internationalization. And the third step that you can see, it's the perpetration of very high profile terrorist operations, Al Qaeda like operations, committed outside Syria and Iraq, mostly in Western states, but not only, which are meticulously organized in Syria and Iraq. And of course, the one I'm thinking of is the Paris attack on November 13th, which was carefully organized in Syria and Iraq and committed abroad. So that's the third step in this internationalization process, but it's not only in Western states. What happened in Jakarta, in the, um, I think it was on January 16th or something like that, that was exactly the same, exactly the same. So this is why, in addition to a local objective, the establishment of a state, Al uh, the Islamic State now has an international objective. And in that sense, it got much closer to Al-Qaeda than it was at the beginning, when it was just sitting, seeking sorry, to establish a state. Now let's look at the members. Who are those who fight for Islamic State and who are those who fight for Al-Qaeda? There are two major differences between them. The first one is where they're from. If you look at the original, at the, I mean, the country of origin of all the terrorists, Al-Qaeda primarily recruits individuals 
especially in the early years of Al-Qaeda. Of course, there are some exceptions, but primarily Al-Qaeda recruits individuals in, in Arab states, include in particular Gulf states. If you look, for instance, at the nationality of all the 9-11 hijackers, they were all mostly from Saudi Arabia, some of them, I think, two from UAE, one from Egypt, one from Jordan. Now, if you look at the Islamic State, they recruit foreign fighters worldwide. Of course, some of them come from Arab states, for instance, Tunisia, I mean, as far as I know, is the, is the country which has the most foreign fighters going off to join ISIS. You see, I made a mistake, IS, IS Islamic states. But there are also many coming from Western states, France, Germany, the UK, and also the US. And also more surprising country like Chile and China, who has some of the nationals also with IS. So you see, that's the first difference. The second difference is the ties with criminality. And here, at least in the early years of Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda will only recruit individuals, like very pious individuals, if I may say so, even though I'm one of those who think that um, Al-Qaeda's Al interpretation of Islam has nothing to do with Islam or any religion. Still, compared to Islamic State, Al-Qaeda's narrative is, they rely much more, they, like they rely on a stricter interpretation of theology and gives much more importance to the way their members practice and respect religion. I mean, at least that's the narrative. And this is why terrorists from Al-Qaeda actually have very little ties with the criminal world. Now, if you look at the Islamic State, Islamic State has very strong ties to criminality. For instance, you look, if you look carefully at the profiles of those who committed attacks in Paris on, on, on the 13th of November, I mean, they were all criminals. Before being jihadists, but before, First, they were criminals who then got radicalized, most of them in prison, but first they were criminals. For the best example is, for instance, the Abdeslam brothers uh, who participated in the, in the attacks. One of them uh, died and the other one, God knows where he is. Both, they had a cafe in Molenbeek, which is this um, um, Brussels um, neighborhood. Uh, they had a cafe which was shut down in August 2015 due to drug-related activities. So before becoming jihadists, most of them were just mere criminals. So that's another difference. Now the enemies. And that's, um, that's another, I think, difference. The most important, what I think one of the most important difference. IS is a Sunni group. It's a Sunni group that fights all those who do not approve what they think is their interpretation of Islam. And so therefore, the enemies include moderate Sunnis and also Shia Muslims. And if you look at the numbers, actually, let's not forget that Muslims are the first victims of the Islamic State. Shia Muslims and moderate Sunnis. Now, on the contrary, if you look at the Islamic State, if I may, I mean, like Al-Qaeda, sorry, um, if I may say so, they're more open in the sense that Al Bin Laden always, always consistently stressed unity among uh, all Islamists, including non-Sunnis, um, non like Shia Muslims. Al-Qaeda's enemy is the, what they call the far enemy. And the Western world, and of course the US in particular, that's the primary enemy. So you see here again, when it comes to the enemy, you have a difference between the two groups. In brief, what we can say is that Al-Qaeda's war is more like ideological, us versus the West. However, um, at the Islamic State's fight struggle is more, let's say, confessional. Now the founding, and that's the part that interests me, one of the parts that interests me the most. It's another great difference between the two groups. Al-Qaeda was rich, very rich, especially when Bin Laden was alive. I mean, Bin Laden himself was a billionaire. But Al-Qaeda, it's nothing compared to the Islamic State. Islamic State is the richest armed group in modern history. And it has to be clear, it's the, mo it's the richest armed group in modern history. To give you an idea, it was $2 billion. Okay, it's a bit less than Donald Trump, but still quite a lot of money. But when it comes to money, the main difference is actually not where it comes from. I mean, it's not how much money they have. It's actually where it comes from. Al-Qaeda's money came primarily from states and private individuals, as I was telling. Um, ben Laden himself was actually a billionaire. But things have changed since 1989, and it's a very interesting evolution. 1989, when Al-Qaeda was established, things are, things are very different. That type of terrorism financing does not really exist anymore. 
And that does not only concern Islamic terrorism, it's all sorts of terrorism. There has been a dramatic decline in the number of countries and private individuals that help with the financing of armed groups. And actually, uh, there still are some states and individuals, okay? Let's be clear, there are still some, I'm not gonna name any states, but there are still some states who allegedly provide, I mean, help with the financing of terrorist groups. There are still some, but much less than before. Things are so different today. If you look at the terrorist group, they are actually, um, they have to look for other sources of funding and if you think about it, there are not that many options. If you don't get your money from states, if you don't get your money from private individuals, what do you do? You turn to crime. I mean, there are not that many options left. And so that's why terrorist group today, they're terrorists, okay. But they're also very much criminal organization. And they have to if they want to survive. And there are many examples of this sort of new breed of terrorists who are like half terrorists, half gangsters. If you look at the FARC in Colombia, they made millions out of drug trafficking. The Pakistani Taliban, they made millions with like cigarette trafficking. Or another example would be the Somali Al-Shabaab who made millions by exporting charcoals to the Gulf states. Because they have to find money somewhere. Therefore, the Islamic State is not the first terrorist organization who conducts criminal activities, but they really took it to another level when it comes to how much money they make, but also the level of organization of their activities. It's not only a very violent terrorist organization, it's also the most organized and powerful criminal organization. It's a very successful criminal enterprise. And actually, when I had to look in detail at um, the financing system of the Islamic State, I mean, it's impressive what I saw. They have like a, a, a blueprint uh, with a very elaborated corporate plan an annual strategy, an annual report, some key indicators, 14 key indicators that to measure the monthly performance. They have, I mean, a board. I mean, it's really, really organized like a, like a huge corporation. Now, where does the money come from exactly? First, oil. They make 1.5 million US dollar per day. They control 10 oil facilities in Iraq and Syria. They produce pretty much between 35 and 40,000 barrel per day that they sell for, let's say, $35 per barrel. They make 1.5 million US dollar. And the good thing about oil, and it's that actually it's not actually the case for gas, is because oil, you don't need that much expertise. You can just extract it crude, put it in the barrel, and if you can't refine it, you just let the other doing it. So you just, it's quite easy. So that's why they make so much money out of it. And actually, let's say that most of the oil, which is sold on the black market, of course, is sold to the Syrian government. Now, another thing is tax, 11 million US dollars per month. Allegedly, they made, uh, according to a CNN report, they made like 360 million of just from tax in 2014. So tax, uh, they have a very elaborated um, taxation system, thanks to which, so they make 11 million. They tax everything, all goods entering or leaving the territory they control. They also tax farmers, they control 40% of agricultural lands in, 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 uh, in Iraq, just to tell you how much they control. And of course, what they call the Jiza, which is a tax that Christians have to pay uh, in order not to convert to Islam. Um, another thing is robberies. They, just to give, I mean, it's quite incredible. They stole, they robbed 475 millions in cash, dollars in cash from the Mosul Central Bank. So just let you imagine how many trucks you need to transport that amount of cash. It's huge. Antiquities, of course, they, there is a lot, there is a big, there is a lot of antiquities trafficking. Um, and that again is being very, that's, I mean, it's not the first time, I mean, for instance, the Nazis also did that. And then you, we found like 60 years after, like some items that were stolen during the Nazi regime, but they stole a lot of them and they're selling a lot of them. They're destroying, so what you see on TV, you see them destroying them, but they actually, um, sell them, some of them. Kidnapping for ransoms, um, also um, especially nationals from countries uh, who accept to pay ransoms. And I'm sorry to say, but France, we pay ransoms. For instance, countries, and I mean, we say, no one say that they do, but like France pays ransoms. I mean, they are proof of this one. The US, for instance, in the UK say that they don't pay ransoms, and I think it's quite true. And that's why if you look at most of the hostages taken by the Islamic State, actually from countries like France, for instance. 
because they know that the government are one sooner or later is going to pay. And of course, human trafficking, especially women for minorities, like the Yazidi community, for instance, who are often sold for a sexual slavery. So these are the four main characteristics of Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State and the different. Now, statehood. Let's try because it's a very complicated issue. But IS' primary objective is the establishment of a state, as we saw, in Syria and Iraq. However, and that's a very important point, IS has not been recognized by any state. Not a single state in the world has, has recognized the Islamic State as a state. So legally speaking, can the Islamic State be considered as a state under international law? Because if it does qualify, why actually does it matter if it's a state or not? Why does it matter? Because of course if it qualifies as a state, it becomes subject to rights and obligations under international law that they will not be subjected to if simply considered as non-state actors. And it also has an impact on the qualification of armed conflicts under international humanitarian law. And consequently, the applicable rules, if you consider Islamic State as a state, if you capture Islamic State member, that person becomes a POW, prisoner of war. If you consider the Islamic State as a non-state actress, it doesn't become a POW, and you, just, you can just treat him as a mere criminal. So I think discussing the question of whether an entity is considered as a state under international law has enormous legal significance. So what are the international law criteria for a state? There are four that you can find in the uh, uh, Article 1 of the 1933 Montevideo Convention. The question of statehood is very complex, I must say. Um, but at least, it's quite controversial, but at least these four criteria, everyone agrees on. Permanent population, territory, effective government, capacity to enter into relation with other states. These are the, some sort of the normative basis. Everyone agrees on this one. And then we will see there is a discussion on recognition or not, whether it's a constitutive or declaratory. But at least on this, everyone agrees. So does the Islamic State, um, are these four... Uh, constitutive elements fulfilled. So of course, each of these elements could be extensively discussed, and we can do that after any discussion if you want, but that's, these are my thoughts. Let's try to be quick. Permanent population. Well, IS on the territory they control, there is a population living there, um, roughly six million people. And also there are signs that IS recognize this population as the citizens, they deliver passports. We can discuss that after because, I mean, for instance, uh, you could ask whether this population has to identify themselves with the state and sort of tie the fate to the state or not. Territory, IS control a very large territory. However, the borders of this territory are far from being settled. They actually change every day depending on what battles they lose and win. Um, in 2015, they lost 14% of the territory, but that doesn't matter. Why doesn't it matter? Because in international law, there is no requirement to have defined and settled boundaries to be a state. And so therefore, so long as there is a consistent bend of territory under the control of the government, it can be a state. In our situation, there clearly is a bend of territory. There is clearly a bend of territory which has been in the hands of the Islamic State uh, for a very long time, around Raqqa in Syria. Then an effective government. Does the Islamic State have an effective government on the territory they control? Does it do, do they or not? The type of regime doesn't matter. Whether it's a religious state, dictatorship, it doesn't matter. But you need some sort of governmental authority. And it's a tricky question whether they have an effective government. Because if you look at it, they look like a government. They have a governmental structure. They have on the top, they have like what they call an Emirate Council with the Caliph and two generals, one overseeing Syria, one overseeing Iraq. Uh, they have 12 provinces with provincial governors. Uh, they have also specific ministries for education, health, defense. Uh, I mean, everything. So they look like a government. Now, whether they exercise the governmental authority, that's a tricky question. Because they have some authority over varied uh, facets of life. Like, for instance, uh, they have uh, their own police, their own schools, their own hospitals, banking systems, tax system. They collect taxes. They provide water. They provide uh, health services. So it looks like they have some, some sort of governmental institutions. The problem, and I think that's one of the most important challenges that Islamic State is facing, is whether or not they have the 
the people to run these facilities because it's good to have a hospital, to control a hospital, but you need people to run it. You need doctors, you need teachers, you need engineers. You cannot have an old facility or a gas plant, but you need people to run it. And that's one of the main challenges because all these people who are usually educated people, technocrats, they usually left and they don't want to be with the Islamic State. And it's not that many people who are, with, who are within the Islamic State who stayed with them because they didn't have the choice. But these people had the money to leave early. So they left, and that's one of the main challenges because they don't really have them yet. There was this case of this Malaysian doctor, for instance, uh, plus she was a woman, so of course it draws a lot of attention, but that's the trying to get experts to run all these facilities. So although it has begun establishing its own government institutions, its governance capabilities are on an elemental stage. Now capacity, do they? I don't think so, and I'm, because as I was telling you, uh, not a single state has recognized the Islamic State as a state under international law. Not a single state has recognized it as a state. And actually, you have more than 60 states fighting against the Islamic State. So how could a state have the capacity to enter into diplomatic relations with states if no one recognizes it as a, as, a, as, a, as a state? So it doesn't have the capacity. And that leads us, and I'm not going to talk about it because I'm running late, but like this will lead us to the question of recognition of international law whether it's constitutive, whether, whether it's an, a requirement or not. But since, to make, it, to, make it, to make it just briefly, since there is absolutely no recognition, they don't have the capacity to enter into relation with other states. They don't have the capacity. And even if they received one, two, or three recognition, that's gonna happen sooner or later, maybe in 10 years, maybe, I mean, well, I don't know, but that could happen. Well, here they will have the capacity, so they will feel these four requirements. So they could exist as a state, but the problem is that from a functional point of view, they will not be able to function as a state. They could become a state, exist as a state, but they could not function as a state. So from a functional point of view, they could not be a state. Now, just to end this presentation, some thoughts uh, about um, how to effectively counter the Islamic State. So again, we can talk about it um, um, more First of all, I'm sure you all know that um, this weekend started negotiations in Geneva. How to say that? Um, negotiations are good. It's better than force, if you can do it. The problem is that, and I was reading this morning, that the, at the last minute, the, 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 um, the opposition sent a delegation, which is a good thing, I think. But the problem is that the Islamic State is not represented. And I'm sorry to say, but if you want to go if you want to try to end the conflict through negotiation, which is always better than the use of force, I agree. I mean, you have to invite all the parties to the negotiation. I mean, how come do you invite Bashar al-Assad, who is the responsible for the death of over 300 civilian, uh, 300,000 civilians in this country and not Islamic State? It's not that one is bad or worse than the other, it's just that you have to invite, if you want to negotiate and try to find a compromise, you have to invite everyone. I think that's my opinion, and also because no one agrees on what role, um, I mean, what, um, Assad should become. A campaign, I'm not one of those who think that it's completely useless. Definitely not. Uh, I mean, if we look at it, like, by targeting all facilities, the air campaign helped a lot to decrease the income of the Islamic State. That's clear. That's clear. It helped a lot to reduce the territory it controlled. That's, that's clear from airstrikes. But it will never be enough to get rid of the Islamic State on the long term. It will never be enough. And also, it costs a lot of money. And I think it's something we have to look at. I mean, seriously, like when you spend like billions of dollars striking, like bombarding a state abroad, and when at, back at home, you have other problems. Islamic State is one of our problems, but it's not the only one, unfortunately. We also have like big high rate of unemployment, um, big economical problems. And it's a question that we have to ask ourselves whether it's actually um, a good thing or not. Boots on the ground, I prefer not to get into that, uh, but the recent history has proved that it's not been very successful. And now, and um, should we work with Assad or not? Maybe you can give me your thought, I, will, I won't give them to you now. And um, I think another idea is to work more closely with the local actors, because, and in particular the Kurds, I must say, because the Kurds, if you look at them, they are the ones who um, are actually fighting IS on the ground, and they have proved extraordinarily uh, effective, military speaking. So I think we have to provide more support uh, to local actors, Syrian, um, I mean, the Free Syrian Army, the Iraqi government, more uh, support to the local actors, 
put pressure on Turkey, put pressure on Turkey for them to stop bombarding, and that's my opinion, to stop bombarding the Kurds, uh, and also stop uh, and kind of, kind of cutting off the supply lines, because like a lot of weapons, money, and foreign fighters go through the Turkish border. And I think, uh, I mean, doing that, it's kind of helping the Islamic State, I'm sorry to say, but it's kind of helping the Islamic State. Of course, fight better against terrorism financing and radicalization back at home. So of course, we can talk about this for hours. De-radicalization programs, better preventions, working more closely with the local communities, um, the local leaders, but also with family to help them to develop greater awareness of signs of radicalization and also offer them tools I mean, to effectively intervene in the child's radicalization process. So there is like a lot of things we could talk about and, uh, and also anti-propaganda. And I will just end this presentation by maybe just coming back because actually I want to say, uh, on, shall we work with Assad or not? And that maybe you can tell me what you think about. Because like, I mean, here it's a discussion we're having today about the Islamic State, but um, the Islamic State is just part of the problem in Syria. It's just part of the problem. Let's not forget that the existence and the rise and the expansion of the Islamic State is partly a product of Assad regime. And Assad is directly responsible for the death of 300,000 people in Syria. But to counter IS effectively, I mean, we kind of need Assad in one way or another. I mean, it's like if you want to get into a house, you know, if you want to get into a house, of course you can break the window and go through the window. But I mean, if someone gives you the key of the door, it's easier to get into the house. And I think it's exactly the same. And that would not be the first time. It's, you know, my enemy is my friend. My enemy's enemy is my friend. I mean, Churchill did not hesitate to work closely with Stalin at the time to fight against Hitler. I mean, it's not the first time that we will negotiate with the devil, as, as, as today we call um, Assad. So I don't know. Maybe we can, um, I will be very happy to hear your thought. And yeah, thank you very much. So, how does it work now? Sure, yes. I've heard a number of presentations about ISIS and what is it, where did it come from. Yours is by far the best presentation I've heard. Thank you. Now. Thank you. You have the knowledge. I'm curious to hear what would you do if you were in Geneva? How would you change Whoa. what's going on and what would you do? As a PhD student or just exactly. a, as a no, PhD no. student? You are now elevated. You are oh, brought yeah. in as the expert. At the negotiations? Yes. OK. <laughs> Maybe I can take all the questions. I can <laughs> Not to put you on the spot. Or <laughs> wow. Other questions? Maybe it's uh... yeah, sure. I mean, we say that I mean work with Assad, but we know that he's losing. A, I mean, a lot of grounds as well near Damascus and so on. But I mean, how how effective would that be? If I mean, as in, I mean, fighting ISIS again goes back to boots on the ground. That being the Syri Syrian army, I think it's going to be maybe a bit difficult because. Um, on one hand, you would need the free Syrian army to fight as well, like if you want to bring all groups together. But then that that is going back again to the core of the problem. Uh, it's again Assad's regime, the free Syrian army. I mean, how is that going to work in a negotiation? I think that's going to be very difficult. Definitely, yeah. Well, all of a sudden, I don't know who was first. I'm sorry. Well, ladies first. Uh, just actually, just to, just to um, go off of that question, if you had to choose between the Free Syrian Army and Assad, because I think that's a more likely situation, um, in your opinion, which, which is the better choice? For uh, protecting the... For, for in, terms of, in terms of cooperation. Ah, okay. Uh, and what are, the, what are the potential downsides of working with Assad in terms of long-term strategic, um, long strategic view? both in terms of working with other uh, relevant parties in the area yeah. um, and for what it would mean for international law and diplomacy. OK. OK. So here, I mean, that's why I'm a lawyer. You know, I'm not a politician. But uh, and again, I mean, just going to your first question, I mean, if I knew or if I knew, I would, I would be in Geneva. <laughs> and hopefully, uh, what would I do with the negotiation? I think it's good. First of all, that uh, because until I think it was today, I mean, not today, or maybe even today, actually, I just read it this morning, that the opposition came 
when I'm talking about this, the opposition, it's mostly the Free Syrian Army. It's like the moderate oppositions. It's good that they came, and I think it's something which has been strongly encouraged, and I think it's, it was crucial for them to come. Why? Because if they had not come, if these negotiations are going to fail, I hope not, but they may, they may fail. It will not be the first time. They would have been accused to be the responsible for this failure. Now, if, since they are there, the good thing about this is that they can say, well, guys, if it fails, it's our fault, both of us, it's shared responsibility. Or oh, it's your fault, Assad, but it's not ours. So I think that's good. What I would have done, but again, I mean, I'm talking about as an academic, but it's like I would have invited IS. I would have invited IS to do the, to the table of the negotiation. I mean, if you want to get to a compromise, it's such a key actor there. And they're actually much more powerful than the opposition. The other, they are, they're much more modern than the Free Syrian Army. Just to give you an idea, the Free Syrian Army pays $60 as a monthly salary to its fighters. The, uh, the Islamic State, 900 So you have many guys, actually, who are actually before fighting for the Free Syrian Army. They just say, well, guys, now I have a family. I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm not really a jihadist, but I'm going to go with you. So it's just, I think I would have invited definitely the Islamic State. And then the big question is, of course, what we do, what, what do we have to do with Assad? And it's states and, I mean, France and the US, for instance, on one side and on the other side, you have uh, put, um, the Russian government. They don't agree what to do with him. What shall we do with Assad? It's, uh, it's a good question. I think we, we have to integrate it. We can, I, I mean, I'm not in favor of the position that the US and France adopt, meaning being that uh, we completely have to expel him from the negotiation. We don't negotiate with the devil. That I don't agree with. We have to involve him in one way or another. Now, regarding um, just before, yeah, your, 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 your question just about, um, just the third question before the second. Gives me time to think. Uh, is the cooperation, of course, I will negotiate with the Free Syrian Army. I mean, the, rather than Assad. And I will try to give them more means, more training, more, more, more capabilities in order to fight better and try to get some more uh, opposition on their side rather than Assad, definitely. Now, uh, the problem is that also the Free Syrian Army now, it, I, mean, we, 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 I mean, it's very, um, it's a key actor, but it's not the most important one because they don't have, they, they don't have that many fighters, they don't have them that much money. Of course, it's the one you want to negotiate with because they are the Democrats. They are like the children of the Arab Spring, of course, I mean, most of them. So it's the ones you want to negotiate with. But I mean, I think the Kurds are much more powerful today in Syria, in Iraq. They're much more powerful today. And I think also they should be integrated more in the negotiation. And here, I think Turkey has a role to play. It has to stop bombing them and always try to put an obstacle. Always, they always do that. Always, always, always do that. And I think that's a huge mistake. Of course, they don't want for political reasons, whatever. I don't want to get into that. But I mean, effectively on the ground, it's not American airstrikes, it's not French airstrikes, it's the Kurds really who are doing most of the job. So I think we have to reintegrate them and try to maybe make a bigger coalition with the Free Syrian Army and the Kurds because they don't work together. They work, they fight the same enemy, but it's like the US and Iran. I mean, think about that. They fight against the same person, but they're part of different coalitions. On paper, they don't, they're not friends, but they fight against the same enemy. So I think we should try to to make a bigger coalition instead of different ones um, fighting the same enemy, and I think that would be more effective. Yeah. You had another question? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, what are the risks in terms of creating that recognition of IS as a state, of including them in negotiations? Is the, you know, does IS say we'll, we'll come along to the table if? If you recognize state? me as a state, yeah, or, or, or is there any risk in like creating custom? Okay, yeah. Maybe I can answer that quickly before. Uh, the thing with recognition is, as we said, there are four cumulative requirement, requirements. The thing is that if you have no state recognizing IS as a state, that's enough for the for the fourth requirement not to be fulfilled. Okay. Now, if you have one or two, then definitely the four requirements are met. But as I was saying, you know, from a functional point of view, if you just have one state, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to name any, but if you, if you have one state or two states that recognize it as a, that recognizes ISIS as a state, I mean, there is no way uh, the Islamic State is going to function as a state in the sense there is no way it's going to be able to conclude treaties or international organization, or maybe they're going to issue like uh, passports, which will not be recognized by any immigration authority over the world. 
So I don't think there is a, there is no, I mean, you can, you could have a couple of recognition that will not be too risky, definitely not. Um, but I mean, let's see what's gonna happen in 10 years. Because you know, all these requirements, you could tell me there is no permanent population, there is no territory, there is no effective government, there is no capacity. All of them, are, we can discuss them. And you can actually argue in favor that they're not met. But that's like a process. And that's just the beginning. And IS is not on decline, contrary to what many people say. It's not on decline, it's getting better and, and I mean better. Sorry, um, stronger and stronger every day. Other question? Well, first, thank you for your presentation. It's by far one of the most. Thank you. Um, sure. I have actually two questions with regard first to the, uh, if we want, uh, as the international community, and if we want to weigh the interest of the actors in the Syrian conflict, the international community would, yeah, main interest is maybe to end terrorism while the ISIS state wants the statehood or being recognized as a, as a state. While the Syrian government in the same thing would not want their territory to be taken out. Mm -hmm. So if we put ourselves as an international community, would the international community recognize ISIS as a state? with regard to end terrorism? To end terrorism by recognizing IS as a state? No. If they sorry, had, I did, sorry yeah. I didn't understand that. If they recognized ISIS as a state, uh -huh. and like, on the other hand, they would end terrorism as a negotiation ah. agreement. Would, yeah, the, would this would be an effective uh, solution for the Ah, if I is well, you know that's an interesting question. Um, well, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I'm gonna take another question and I will answer this one just right after. Um, ah, okay. For the Free Syrian Army. Yeah. I can agree with you on the issue of the Free Syrian Army maybe three years ago, but now I think the Bashar al-Assad regime succeeded in ending the Free Syrian Army because what you see now is some people who were the Free Syrian Army before and now either with ISIS or in Turkey who have no backbone to be supported with. So I don't think now we can talk about the Free Syrian Army as an actor in the yeah, well, we can, yeah, you, you, you may be right in the sense also that they bomb, they're bombed by the Russians. I mean, you know, it's also something that, fact, that's like a fact that they don't really um, work. Um, but just going back to your first question, we're going to recognize you as a state, but if you end terrorism. Well, it seems like what they want is the, it's, as I was telling you, it's like the establishment of a state. Um, <coughs> but also with a global influence, I don't think that's compatible. I don't think you can create and give ISIS a state and them ending terrorism. Or what they're gonna do, they're gonna just, in, they're gonna just say, okay, we end our foreign, I mean, I don't know if they would ever say that, but let's imagine. They say, we don't do anything abroad. We just, you just give us a state and we'll be fine. Just give us a state and we'll be fine. But the problem is that the, the kind of legislation they wanna apply violate many human rights. And so therefore, the international community will never accept that. They will never accept to, to, to I, th I think, to recognize IS as a state if they, if, if, if they want to uh, apply this legislation. You know what I mean? Um, Negotiation and to control, I, I believe it's part of controlling the issue rather than facing it. If we. Uh, of the international community. Well, that would not be the first time ISIS. that we recognize a state or an entity that, were, that committed atrocious human rights violation in the past. Let's see what happens, but I do really don't see that happening now, mm. honestly. And regarding your, first, your second question, I agree today it's hard to talk about the, 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 the Christian army as, as an actor on its own, but it was joined by other groups, moderate groups, and now when I'm, well, I should say the moderate opposi opposition that comprises the FSA, the Christian army, and other states, and other opposition groups. The Frisian army as a group of its own 
at least it had the intelligence to join all the groups and to make under the umbrella organization of the moderate opposition. And I think we should even include this group with the Kurds and the opposition to be stronger, I think. You had a question? Maybe one, one more? Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. Ah, yeah, sorry. No, no yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> if the Islamic State is recognized as, a, as an actual state or an actual country, does that give the United Nations or NATO any more enforcement mechanisms for military force under Article 5 or Chapter 7? Okay. Does that make sense? The thing, yeah, it makes sense in the sense I don't think that changes anything, especially now with Resolution 2249 that was passed in December. I mean, now they have, they, you know, I don't know if you read this, this Security Council resolution, but the use, they say that now states can use all necessary measures to counter the Islamic State in Syria, which means in a diplomatic language of the Security Council that, guy, you can use force under, under Chapter 7. So we can already use force against Chapter 7. You see? I, can you, re, I, don't, I don't remember this that's one. The, that's the Collective Defense article. Because I know they used it against Al Qaeda again in during 9/11, but there was a much larger scale attack, obviously, on the American homeland versus versus uh, ISIS. Which, yeah, they've had some bombings in Turkey and Paris, but they haven't been at the drastic level of 9/11. Yeah, if they were an actual state with collective defense measure, be able to be used there. Well, they could use it, but they still have to comply with international law and other and the UN Charter. You know, so I mean, I don't. I'm not a specialist in NATO law, but like. I mean, from what I understand from you is that, I mean, we could definitely still have a coalition under Article 5, a sort of collective defense uh, against uh, the Islamic State in Syria, but it has to comply with international law. And it still does. We already have the agreement. So whether we go individually or collectively, it doesn't really change anything, you know? Kalum, you want Kalum? Yeah. First. Yeah, yeah. Um, my question is into Wafas about the Free Syrian Army and the fact that you have, it's not really an effective play anymore. <laughs> So on a more practical note, considering the fact that you have hundreds and hundreds of different factions in Syria fighting both each other and the Islamic State, yeah. how would you integrate them in the negotiations? Because for me, the problem is that we mostly take account of the Kurds and the Free Syrian Army, but not the hundreds of other groups that are actually trying to fight. But that's, that's the thing. That's why. And I think that's, you know, going back to the first question, which was, I think that's a good thing at the negotiation in Geneva. If you look at the, if you look at the table of the negotiation, actually, who sits where? And you look actually that they merge many of these groups together in Geneva. You see, the Kurds are separate because they want to be separate also, but they merge all these different opposition groups together. Now the question is whether, for instance, Jabhat al-Nusra, which is the Al-Qaeda branch, which is an Islamist group, is not also included at the table of the negotiation. What do we do with them? I think we also have to include them. I think everyone has to be represented, you know? And I think the Islamic State and the Syrian regime are just actors among others, and everyone has to be included. If you want to negotiate, if you don't want to use force, if you want to end a conflict through negotiation and not through the use of force, you need to negotiate with everyone who's there. You cannot just negotiate with like 50 or 60 percent of the stakeholders. I mean, it's, yeah? So then this is assuming that the negotiations are to end any conflict in Syria, but yeah. it, it, it might no. be just to be able to effectively fight against IS or Assad, whichever. Yeah, but I truly believe and I hope and I'm a big supporter of peace that we will try one and we will succeed one day to end the conflict through negotiation and once through the use of force. But yeah, it's assuming, of course, that it will work and that it will be a success, definitely. Yeah. Felix, you had a, and then, yeah, maybe last question. I mean, we have to end at what time? Uh, well, we can take one, another one. Okay. Felix, you're okay. Well, I just one question. Uh, from my, oh, do you think there's a legal responsibility of the United States of America for uh, Syria for the situation now? Because from what I <coughs> see, uh, by conducting a war against Iraq and Libya, um, there was a situation created that led to the uh, rise of IS. Well, yeah, international responsibility under what? Under international law? International law. No. What responsibility for what? For example, a uh, responsibility to protect the people in Iraq that are... Well, the thing is that I think there are two things. Maybe we can end because I think that will be the, the topic of the, of the next seminar. For instance, you could try to trigger the responsibility for illegal use of force. Okay? What they did, the, 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 the U.S., they were the first ones to actually strike the, United, the, see, the Islamic State. And they had a very... And actually, I think it's a very smart arg uh, argument. Because they say that they're going to... 
have two different legal arguments, one for Iraq, one for Syria, because this is true. These are two different situations. In Iraq, they relied upon the consent of the, of the Iraqi government. The Iraqi government invited the United States of America to bomb, to bombard them. It's absolutely fine, you know? Then what happened with Syria is that they, the legal argument on which they realized was the collective self-defense of Iraq, collective self-defense under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter, collective self-defense of Iraq against the Islamic State acting from Syria. But the problem here, um, but now, well, the problem here is that under uh, Article 51 of the UN Charter and Customary International Law, if you want to act in, like, um, in self-defense against an actor, this actor has to be either a state or a non-state actor whose the conduct is attributable to a state. And here, clearly, the, the, the ISIS, like, does, like it's, um, its conduct cannot be, cannot be attributed to any state. So here, I think what the U.S. say, they say, well, but the problem is that what can we do then? And then they, had what they, 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 they relied upon what they call the unable and unwilling doctrine. I don't know if you hear about that. They say, well, the Syrian government is unable to, um, to destroy ISIS. They're unwilling to destroy ISIS, therefore we're going to do it. This unwilling or unable doctrine, which is um, prominent in the U.S., uh, but only in the U.S. I don't think under international law it reach uh, a customary international law today. I think so. But, the, but all these discussions now is over because the Security Council allowed and authorized the use of force under the security uh, collective system, the collective security system. So now the discussion about self-defense, whether they violate international law related to the use of force, it doesn't really matter anymore. So I think we can, uh, yeah, we have to end. Well, thank you very much. For